get away. God is doing a mighty work throughout this land. We're privileged to be part of that work. I've said it before, but it's no coincidence that we have got connected up. It's no coincidence that Jason and Ali met. It's no coincidence that Jen spoke to Gary and we contacted. There's something of the Spirit in all of this and a move of God. But it's a remnant, which sounds really, on the one hand, exciting, but on the other hand, maybe a bit arrogant. Um, when I came out to Jehovah's Witnesses, I never wanted to go back into a dogmatic way of acting. You know, I'm right, they're wrong. Um, there is a a wide diversity in the body of Messiah. But there's a lot, unfortunately, a lot of darkness. There's a lot of, a lot of things that shouldn't be there. I was um, asked a little while about why I'm I. I say I, I don't believe it's an I. I say I, and I apologize for that. But why we're here, and why we felt moved to um, meet regularly, why we meet in homes. And that bugged me for a little while. It's, it's been bugging me for a couple of months, whether or not this is um, simply human endeavor or, or, a, or a ego or an individual wanting to do things and not listening to God. So that's really weighed heavy on me. And um, it was at Moriel, really. It's been building for a while, but um, a dear sister told me to rest in the Lord, and I believe I've done that. In fact, it's been confirmed. Nadine had a, a word. Um, and as usual, as it happens, it all connects. It's no coincidence. The Lord works like that within the body especially within tight-knit family relationships where you can't get that in a, a gathering of a hundred or two hundred or three hundred. It's, it's, it's there that God can really begin to move and work. Um, just very briefly, what Nadine saw um, I think relates to us all, not just me, and that was a shed or a shack, a dark it dark inside, but she saw a pair of hands. And these hands, um, on the window ledge, there was plants. That's right. Plant pots. And uh, these hands were sort of examining these plant pots. We chose one particular plant pot and took a seed and popped the seed in, in this plant pot. And then put a bag over the plant pot, tied it up, and outside it was lashing with rain and it was adverse weather, but inside, with these hands and this seed and this nurturing, it, it began to grow. And there was a mixing of soils, wasn't there? The hands were taking not just any old soil, but the right mixture, putting it together and popping it in this pot with the seed. From there, you saw the, the, the plant was planted out, wasn't it, into a green open field and grew into a great cedar. And um, for me, the connection was that I was under that cedar, but I believe that God wants us all under the cedar. And when it comes to the soil, there's various soils. Jesus even pointed that out various places the seed gets set. If you want to grow, if we want to grow, then we need the Lord Jesus to take the soils and the nutrients from the right places for us to grow. And sadly, 
um, within the body of Messiah, there's not many places you can go and grow. Now that may sound harsh. Um, I'll leave that with you. Really what I drew from this for myself was that the Lord God himself in these last days is equipping the saints and for those who are listening and wanting to grow and be equipped and, and be equipped for what? For what is coming? And it was uh, again at Moriel that I felt that the reason we're meeting, the preparation that the Lord is already doing, the streams throughout this country, throughout America, where God is drawing people. This is, this is his preparation. As Jacob put it, people were there for us when we came out. And we need to be there for when others come out. And when I say that, I don't just mean converts from atheism or I'm on about the church. I'm on about those who have outgrown where they are. Or are even certain ones <coughs> have been poisoned. Yeah? And they need to get out to grow. The time is coming where every denomination in this country will have to submit to a certain ethic that the government pushes on them, a certain way, a certain can't preach that, can preach that, can't do this, can't do that. If you want to use the Bible, you're going to get persecuted from everyone, even within the body. Um, I had it this last week, discussing with a, an actual teacher, um, a college lecturer, arguing that universalism is a, an okay doctrine. And uh, you'll see as I go through this, I'm not going to be too long on this because Sean's got his to do, but there's a... I don't even know how to describe it. There's a, there's a dropping of everything, <laughs> scripturally. There's, there's basically throwing it away and starting again. A whole paradigm shift. Uh, the Bible says that the judgment begins with the house of God. It always has done. It did with Judah, it did with the northern tribes. Um, if we've got a mic, pass it to Steph. I just, I'm not doing this to pick on people, I'm just trying to highlight a condition that is existing within many um, churches. And it is, it's that what I said about how um, people in, uh, read the Bible, how some people read it. Do you want to just share that? Um, one of my friends um, shared with me that she wanted to start studying Genesis in depth. Um, so she was asking me if I knew of anyone who could um, tell her anything about Genesis. And I suggested um, the website Answers in Genesis and also um, Chuck Missler. And um, she told me that she'd seen some of Chuck Missler and she didn't think he was in depth enough. Um, and <laughs> which is funny. Um, and um, she also told me that she had been reading. Um, a Joyce Meyer, Meyer, whatever book, um, and um, something along the lines of she'd been reading it more than the Bible and it was really making sense to her and um, I should read that instead of listening to Chuck Missler and maybe I would be more spiritually awake or something like that. <laughs> mm. Okay, so um, the, these are, this is in, in, endemic, is that the right word? Within the, within the body, um, this um, desire to have everything or 
whatever it is that people are searching for without doing any digging, any really not using the Holy Spirit to illuminate the Word. Yeah? The Word is Jesus. Whether it be the incarnate Word or the Word that we read. And only the Holy Spirit, our desire, will illuminate that. Um, who here has benefited from a, a verse by verse study of Scripture within a home group? Everybody. Okay. That really sums up what I'm trying to say then. Something else I noticed as I've spoken to different ones study seems to be topical rather than expositional. That means the verse by verse that we draw so much from, many don't do that. They have a topic and then they just sort of draw verses from all over. There's nothing wrong with that, a topical study of, say, hell or whatever. But, I don't know, God can't seem to work the same or doesn't seem to work the same when you've got that agenda or if you're using a book, Alex. Yeah, topical study with for the children. children. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, I can see that for the children because you've got to keep their attention. Anyway, um, the other thing is, I don't know if you've noticed, but a lot of Christians don't really know what's going on in the world. They've got no idea. Um, uh, I, I picked, or oh, Ali got us a newspaper. I'm not going to read it to you because it's full of junk, but um, just flicking through, by the time I get to page eight, binned anti litter poster that was an insult to Muslims. A whole article on how Muslims are uh, playing up over it. People can't see it, but there's a whole change in the fabric of, of our society. There's a spiritual thing going on. The, people can't see it. They can't see what's going on. Whether it's Islamic, whether it's within the body of Messiah, it's like they're blind. I think the media as well is part and parcel of this uh, you know, method of Satan to just keep everybody happy, you know? Like the Romans did with the Colosseum, keep everyone happy, pretend it's not happening. Put your TV on, Christmas, blah, 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 blah. How much do you see about Israel or the Middle East? You know, everything that's brewing, everything that's on its way, the darkness. Anyway. That's my little rant. Oh yeah, I'll just share this with you. Um, Chuck Missler brought this out, and I'll have to get on. But um, debt, national debt. Does anybody understand what a trillion is? What trillion? Uh, Chuck put it like this in in regard to seconds. How long in, in days would you say a million seconds is? A million seconds is 12 days. Yeah. Now when you say billion, it doesn't seem much of a jump, does it, really? Just million, billion. A billion seconds is 32 years. A trillion seconds is 32,000 years. The current debt of America is between 27 and 53 trillion. Some estimates up to 200 trillion. America's bankrupt. If you were to lose a million dollars a day from the time of Jesus' birth, so you set up a business, you're losing a million dollars a day. To reach one trillion, it would take you to the year 2737. So, 
the nations are hoodwinking everyone. The British debt, 900 million last year, this year 1.1 trillion. The current interest the government have to pay to the people who they owe the money is 43 billion um, a year in interest, which is more than they spend on all the armed forces. UK debt, or rather the percentage that the overseas people have invested in British government, 35% of, of every of the um, is overseas investors, 35 percent. If they were to pull the rug, anyone understand what quantitative easing is? Printing money. It's a posh word for printing money. Italy's in trouble. Spain. There's there's a whole thing coming, and it will lead to a world currency. Um, Chuck mentioned the Weimar Republic in Germany before the Second World War. In 1920, you would go to the bakers and it would cost you one mark for a bread loaf. In 1923, it would cost you 726 million marks for a bread loaf. And that's what happens when you print money, quantitative easing. And that's what's coming to America. As soon as they lose the dollar, as soon as the dollar becomes obsolete, then everything's going to come crashing down. Can you see how the Antichrist is being set up? Yeah? He's on his way. Um, and the way that they create money, I'll just say this because I, I thought it was interesting. Have you heard of gilt edge security? Yeah, so Bill knows. Basically, paper bonds are produced and the, 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 the idea is that they're absolutely secure. And then they're actually um, auctioned off with a fixed interest. And that's how the government raises its money, through this producing of bonds. Um, the IMF says that if the bonds fail, then Britain will need a bailout. Have you ever noticed on the markets there's lots of um, asking for gold all the time? Have you, do you know the value of gold? In 2001, gold was $252 an ounce. In 2011, gold is $1,500 an ounce. People are shifting where they're investing, gold. They've got, they're losing their confidence in the dollar. So, anyway, the bottom line of this, for us, is that this is a, a spiritual thing. That there's a moral free fall in, in the West. You know, the greed of people. I'll admit I was the same you know, credit cards and all the rest of it, but the, the whole thing behind it is spiritual. And then on top of that, you've got this drumming down of truth and drumming down of even education, you know. Um, revisionism I've written down here. Anyway, the point is, how does this affect Christians and how does it affect Christianity? Um, keep me on the time because I don't want to use up Sean's time. Uh, but, uh, forgive me if you've seen all this before, but for those who haven't, when we come to the scriptures, you'll find within the Christian community a whole array of views when it comes to the Bible, how you interpret the Bible. And just very, very simply, that red line um, represents where you are, either on the right with a high view of scripture, that means you just believe it is the word of God, or on the left, a, a very low view where you don't. Now for us who have a high view, it's difficult to believe that a Christian would have a low view, but you find it's more common than you think. 
So if you have a low view, you become very critical of the Bible. It hasn't that much relevance. Whereas if you have a high view, when you read it, you see it very literally, which is why we see things in the world happening and we just read the Bible and we read the newspapers and we say, we can see it. The poor old liberal can't see it because he's tossed most of the Bible out. So, higher criticism of the Bible leads to scepticism. Um, I've seen this even in friend, a, f a particular friend recently. Um, whereas a, a high view of Scripture leads to a real assurance. Did you feel that assurance when we were praying with Jason and Ali? A real powerful work of God. If you have a low view of Scripture, it's very subjective. So you can't pin anything down. The whole thing's like a, a jelly moving around and, and you can't be sure of anything. Whereas with a high view of Scripture, you can be sure. You can, you can build your faith on something that's solid. A liberal view will lead to amillennialism, which is where you don't believe that Jesus is going to set up a millennial kingdom. Um, whereas we are either, you know, a premillennial view, whether that's pre tree or post or, or mid. Amillennialism leads to supersessionism, which is what Stephen Sizer was, when, if you watch the debate. Whereas if you have a high view of scripture, you will see Israel as part of God's plan. Supersessionism leads to a very political Christianity, a social gospel, where Jesus isn't coming back, so we need to get sorted out and, you know, make everybody Christian or get on with each other. Whereas if you have a high view of scripture, then the eschatology, that is the view of an end time, and all the sequences leading to the return of Christ are really, really solid and important. Triumphalism or dominionism is something that comes from a low view of Scripture where you, think, where you feel that you as a Christian have got to take over the world. Whereas if you have a high view of Scripture, we're just praying, come Lord Jesus. We're doing our best in this world. We're not hiding in bunkers. We're doing what we can. But we're ambassadors of the coming King. The liberal view, as I've said before, leads to confusion. You'll find that people just don't know, then they're not sure. Whereas a high view of scripture really does free you in Christ. Okay. Okay. Um, experience and spirit. This, these are the two things that seem to get really confused. Um, <clears throat> on the liberal side, you tend to find that it's more experiential. Um, the spirit is really emphasized, whereas sometimes the fundamental side, the high view, can be a bit dry and a bit doctrinal. What you need to do is mix the two. Get the right mix, like that soil. Pop the seed in. Got to work. Now, one of the problems with the world we live in is relativism. Now, relativism, if you speak to anyone who holds this view, and people hold it and don't even know they hold it, it's like seeped into society. There is no absolute truth. Truth is always relative to some particular frame of reference, such as language or culture. So if you're a Christian and you say, I'm a Christian, the, ration, uh, sorry, the relativists will say, oh, well, that's because you were born here and you met, you know, they'll explain it away. Um, this goes way back. This, this whole idea, this whole philosophy, the Sophists, Plato, Aristotle, you remember those? This guy... Protagoras said, what is true for you is true for you. What is true for me is true for me. Now, if you take that to its extreme, that means if you're a, into paedophilia, then that's fine. If you're a homosexual, that's fine. And it just goes on and on. You, you just, where do you stop? There's no boundaries. Now, the result of relativism is nihilism or nihilism. And, and that... Uh, Friedrich Neuscher, nihilism is emptying the world and especially human existence of meaning, purpose, comprehensible truth or essential value. How many people do you know are on depressant, antidepressants? How many people do you know who see no purpose to life? This is the result of a relative view of the world. It leads to this meaningless and, and he picked up on that. 
Now he said, which is interesting for a philosopher, he said Christianity is an antidote against a primal form of nihilism. And what he means by that, I'll go back to that one in a minute. What he means by that is that if you introduce meaning or a hope, yeah, you're gonna, it's going to be an antidote to this meaningless, it's common sense, yeah? So if you give somebody the gospel message and they receive it and they're born again, it, it's an antidote to that meaningless existence. But, like every good philosopher, they always uh, go too far. And again, he attacked Christianity. But he also had a point here. He said, in its drive towards truth, Christianity eventually finds itself to be a construct which leads to its own disillusion. What it means is that in the end, this drive for truth and sharing of truth, you go beyond truth and you end up back where you started. I believe that could be well happening within the body of Christ now. Uh, so disillusion leads beyond to scepticism, to a distrust of all meaning. You end up with a, a cycle that goes right the way back. Is, it, is anyone lost yet? No? Okay, so let's have a look at the effect on the church. <clears throat> if you take that into the church, that everything is relative, don't worry about truth, then there's no religious truth, there's no moral truth, there's no doctrinal truth, there's no absolute biblical truth. And so what you end up with is this. And this is what somebody said to me this week. Christian X claims to be born again. Christian Y interprets the Bible in a different way. So Christian X claims that Christian Y is not born again and is deluded. Trouble is, Christian Y could say exactly the same thing about Christian X. You see the problem. But the problem is because of this, these first four. If they're abandoned, then you're only going to end up with this confusion. But m many Christians don't understand that they've even abandoned it. Uh, Albert Moyler, he said, the modern attempt to dominate truth has given way within sectors of the church to the postmodern rejection of truth itself. Indeed, in many denominations and churches, notions of orthodoxy and heresy have become conceptual emptiness. The boundaries have vanished. The very possibility of heresy is dismissed in many circles within mainline Protestantism, and many evangelicals seem to have no better grasp of the moral imperative to honour the truth and to oppose error. Anyone feel that that is pretty accurate? What that's saying is that there is postmodernism, rationalism, infiltrating the body of Messiah so that people ha are actually rejecting the truth of Scripture. And so that leads to this vagueness, this emptiness, there's no boundaries, and there's no reason to even stand up and say, be counted for truth, because there is no truth. Just believe Jesus. That's it. He goes on to say, an aversion to doctrinal Christianity has been growing for several decades, along with an increase in intolerance for doctrinal and confessional accountability. There's been a wave going through the, the Christianity that is gaining momentum, and if you pick up your Bible and say, I'll show you this, this is the truth. Sorry, there is no truth. That's what's happening. In the name of a paradigm shift, the claim to objective truth has itself been forfeited by some evangelicals. You've heard of the emergent church. Anybody not? There's a whole movement. It's called the emergent church. And it's a paradigm shift from traditional authentic orthodoxy and Christianity. This is how I think it might work, and uh, this is just my opinion. If we go down here, we have no truth, okay? You, you, you have no meaning in your life, you're lost. You search for truth, you might search for a long time. Eventually you come to Christian truth. The Christian truth sets you free. You're born again. And then, 
you begin to drift beyond truth. Why would you drift beyond truth? Because truth itself has not been maintained, not been protected, not been stood up for. So you drift beyond truth and in the end you're back to know truth. And if you've ever met a Christian who is in that there, he's very bitter, very angry because he feels like he's been hoodwinked. But really, he's just gone beyond truth. There are absolutes in Scripture. Jesus was absolutely born of a virgin. Jesus absolutely did die on a cross. Jesus did absolutely rise from the dead. Any of these doctrines that are attacked and you end up with, no, he didn't then you're on that road to no truth. So, no truth. A quote from Albert Moyler again. An attitude of indifference, whether based in postmodern deconstructionist theory or simple epistemological, that's knowledge, apathy, is a scandal to the gospel and a looming threat to the church. In simple terms, postmodernism deconstructs everything turns it into a mush, a confusion. And so the search for knowledge is abandoned, because there is none. And that leads to this apathy within the church. And this is a threat to the very gospel itself. He goes on, virtually no doctrinal essential has been left untouched. No truth left intact, no creed or confession defended against compromise. Increasingly, in the name of pluralism, tolerance, inclusivity, sensitivity, all that is solid appears indeed to melt into air. And, oops, this um, pluralism within churches, tolerance for everybody, inclusivity, you see it everywhere. There's no absolutes. And so, that if there's no absolutes, there's no doctrinal truth. Where's it going? Emergent Church, I've mentioned. This is a quote from Peter Rollins, how not to speak of God. Okay? The emerging church is able to leave aside the need for clarity. This is what you're dealing with. And open the way for us to accept the fact that what is important is that we are embraced by the beloved rather than find an agreement concerning how we ought to understand this beloved. So you see the shift is from um, no need to search for anything. <clears throat> you just you don't need to understand or, or have a, a, a solid doctrinal belief. You just, it's all <laughs> cotton wool, isn't it? It's like, it's, anyway. So, there's nothing new under the sun because this is how it's always been. When that serpent went to uh, Eve, did God actually say that? You shall not eat from the tree. There's always this question of, did, it, did he really say that? Is, is there really truth? So without absolute truth, truth can either be added or subtracted from. And I've said already, the first casualty is scriptural authority, scriptural truth. So the, there is within the body of Messiah, sadly, a weaning off the word. You'll go to a, well, I think Jason's been to lots of different churches, uh, and I think he's found this, that the word itself is no longer prominent, no longer put at the front. It might be a discussion on how to help people, you know, um, raise funds for uh, some, something in Africa, all good things, but actually what's happening is this weaning off the word. Now the, the Bible's clear, it says, for everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. We're encouraged in scripture to go beyond the milk, to keep growing. Satan's objective, remove biblical truth from Christianity. Remove doctrinal truth and produce shallow, functionally illiterate Christians. Is that too harsh? 
It's not my words, actually. It's um, Dave's Hunt. Dave Hunt. That's how he views it. That you're producing illiterate Christians. Uh, higher criticism. Anyone know of Rudolf Bultmann? Bill probably does. This guy <coughs> really... Well, there's so many, but he's, he's one that really has um, turned the scales. And, it, you know, you can lead all, the, all these paper trails, go back to different people. Okay, he said, faith must be a determined vital act of will, not a culling and extolling of ancient proofs. Now, to, to a degree, that's true. Faith is faith, isn't it? You step out in faith. You believe in the Son of God. But you can't just throw out the rest, which is what he used to teach. In fact, he spent his whole life deconstructing the Bible. If you read one of his books, he ends up with nothing. You know, Jesus is, you know, he might be there, he might not be there. So what this leads to, and this is what Bultmann really pushed, is that faith is experiential. It's not about knowledge, it's not about your head, it's not about learning, it's not about the Bible. It's about experience. The problem is you can experience things that are not God. How do you know which is which? Unless you have a plumb line of scripture to know. So for Bultmann and his adherents, doctrine becomes meaningless. But what did Paul tell Timothy? What did he warn Timothy? Preach the word, the word of God, the gospel. Be in in, instant in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For a time will be when they will not tolerate or endure sound doctrine, but they will heap up teachers to themselves according to their own lusts, tickling the ear, and they will turn away their ears from the truth and will be turned to myths. But you watch in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fully carry out your ministry. To Paul, it was, a, it, it was all, all encompassing. It wasn't just an experience. It involved the Word of God. You know, when you look, read the book of Acts and you see how Paul defended his faith, it was always from Old Testament scriptures. When he went in the synagogue, he, he used the Old Testament to prove Jesus was Messiah. He didn't toss it away and just say, you know, come here, I'll pray on you. And, you know. it, it was more, far more. The Word was so important. And this word doctrine keeps cropping up in scripture. Alethio. If you look at Strong's definition, um, the word doctrine, alethio, be true in doctrine. Not be chucking it out, not be whatever you fancy, but be true in doctrine. And not only to know the doctrine, but to speak and tell the truth of that doctrine. So in Ephesians, it's interesting how the words mean more or, or, yeah. Rather, speaking the truth, alethio, in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. Speaking the truth. It's been translated truth, but actually it's alethio that in other places is translated doctrine. Rather, speaking the doctrine in love. Something else um, that is affecting the church, and which is what um, Steph was on about, it's called reader response. <clears throat> so instead of asking, what does the text mean? Critics began to ask, can it mean this or can it mean that? In other words, what, don't worry about what it meant when it was written, but what does it mean now to you? In other words, you lift it out of its setting. Grant Osborne says, the focus of interest has thus shifted from the text and the act of coming to an understanding has become an individual self-discovery more than a process of decoding textual meaning. Now, I understand that the Holy Spirit can do things however he wants. Bill's experienced it, we've all experienced it where God shows us a verse that we need and we're blown away by it. But I'm not on about that, I'm on about where you th throw the idea of systematic study out the window, wanting to understand what's behind it. I'll give you an example. Jeremiah 29, 11. Anyone familiar with this? Have you got your Bibles? I don't know who this guy is. I just flicked him up on the internet. He's a doctor, so he must know everything. 
Dr. Al Horta said, we believe God is a good God and he wants you saved. Amen. Healed and prosperous. And uh, I went on Kenneth Copeland's website and Mr. Dollar says that God has a place he wants us to go. Destination, prosperity, overflow. That's the verse they used to do it. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Now if you take that verse in isolation, you can basically do whatever you want with it. So if you want a new car, and you read that verse, God wants me to have a new car. If you, I don't know, you can just go on and on. The question is, at what point does, does that no longer, uh, is it no longer truth? See, there's a devotional way to read scripture. There might be a, a time in your life where that scripture really helps you on its own. But you can't use that scripture to teach God's going to give you prosperity. Now, why? I'll show you why. First of all, you have to understand it in its historical setting, in its grammatical setting, and in the context of what's going on. So what you would do is, you would take your Bible and you start in Jeremiah 29, maybe look at some footnotes and try to understand what was going on. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. So, who's he talking to? He's talking to the exiles in Jerusalem. Okay? Sorry, in Babylon. So, we begin to draw a picture of what's going on, the political situation. Nebuchadnezzar has attacked Jerusalem. He's taken thousands into captivity. All right? Jeremiah chapter 29, according to the scholars, is written three years into the 70-year captivity. So that's the setting. So let's have a look at the context. Verse 7 but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare you will find your welfare. What do you think he's telling them? Where were it to that they, they, the exiles, to seek their welfare? Right. God said you're going to Babylon for 70 years. You seek your welfare there because you ain't coming home. <clears throat> For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams that they dream, for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. When the Israelites were there in Babylon, there were prophets, so-called prophets, that saying, don't listen to Jeremiah, we're off home in two years, I've got the date, two years, we're off home. They, they were false prophets. God did not send them. So in verse 10, as you read through that whole chapter, for thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you. I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. So, God had already got his plan. He says, I know the plans for you that they were going to be within that 70 year period in exile. He cared for them so long as they listened to his true prophets in the exile and then he was going to bring them back. I jump on that. Uh, 12 to 14 says, Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me. And when you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I've driven you, declares the Lord. I will bring you back to the place from which I've sent you into exile. Now, do you understand how this is playing out when you look at it in its full context? It's not about prosperity overflow. God was not speaking to us in that, if you take it in its setting. He was talking to the exiles in Jerusalem. 
Sorry, I keep saying that, don't I? Babylon. So when you look back at it, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans, in the, in the Hebrew, plans to shalom you. <laughs> and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in the future. The NIV tries to uh, um, expand on the word shalom. And so that's where you get this idea of prosperity and then it's misinterpreted by certain people. But that's just because the translators wanted to get into the depth of shalom and unfortunately it's been misused. So, shalom, the principle, is relational. Even in the midst of his own executed judgment, God comforts them with the predicted return and future blessings. That's what's really going on in the text. So how do we use that? Do we leave it in history? No, we can draw a principle. God sets the promise before us that while we are on her earth, we are put to the test. Yeah, just as they were. They were put to the test. So God refines us like gold before sending us into glory. And for me, that's far more moving, rewarding, and, you know, within your heart than this endless chasing after, after prosperity. Um, I, bet, I, bet, I, bet, I didn't realise I'd put so much down, sorry. Uh, textual autonomy, something else that we've already touched on. <clears throat> that's the idea that the text is actually lifted out of its own original meaning. That's what they've done to Jeremiah 29, 11. Now, who do we blame? Who, who do you think... I shouldn't really portion blame, but... Devil, devil ultimately. False teachers. But also the responsibility of <coughs> the people who want that message because it said that they will accumulate teachers for themselves. That's right. Who, so they want this message. That's right. Why is it that um, a prosperity preacher's got three or four Lear jets and cars? And, because the people want it. And Jacob crushed the, um, used a good expression that says you have prophets and then you have prophets. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I think there's a difference between the two. Yeah. A, a, a false prophet will always start with, I have a word. Yeah. And a true prophet will start with, false word. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So, just going on um, in Jeremiah there, it says, The priest did not say, Where is the Lord? The priests weren't asking where the Lord was. Those who handle the Lord did not know me. The shepherds transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal, and they went after things that did not profit. And yet they said, I am innocent. <laughs> Behold, I'll bring you to judgment for saying I have not sinned. The priests, the people in charge, the shepherds, the prophets, it was all false. And they were still saying, I'm innocent. And yet God said, no, you come into judgment. So where is this leading? It's, a, it's an interesting uh, word, up, um, explanation I, I picked up from Chuck Missler. Wrath of abandonment. We, we know of God's wrath, don't we? We know what it speaks of in Revelation. We know how he pours his wrath out. But I've never seen it like this. An abandonment wrath, where he just literally abandons them to whatever they want. So Samson, Israel, Judah, in, in the end, when they stopped listening, he abandoned them. So when we look at Jeremiah's day, there, there's a, a paradigm of the last days. Um, you'd have to look into that yourself to be sure that I'm not you know, telling you fibs. But there's, an, there's eschatological patterns. There's, there's patterns that we can draw from that bring us to a similar pattern in these days that we live. Now, uh, I've said it before, Laodicea is the last church age that's mentioned in Revelation, but the problem is she doesn't know that she's Laodicea. But this is where we fit in, I believe. I believe this is what God is doing. There is a faithful remnant in Laodicea. They're zealous Christians, but they're going to be mocked. They're going to be scorned by lukewarm ones. If you're ready and willing, God's going to 
take us on and we're going to be there ready for those who are going to come out of this lukewarmness. But the price to pay is that we will be mocked. Okay. So I'll hand over to Sean. Uh, everyone all right for a bit? Yeah?